and cast her wealth into the sea, and she will be consumed with fire. And so, uh, you know, this talks about the, one of the first conquests of Alexander the Great, uh, which is the city of Tyre. Now, the city at this time was a, an island city about a half a mile off the coast of uh, the mainland in, in the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, uh, it was thought of as being kind of an impregnable city, you know, being that it was an island that also had uh, great fortifications. In fact, uh, there have been several attempts in the past of different uh, empires that had tried to uh, conquer uh, Tyre. Uh, one of them was the Assyrians, and they laid siege to, to Tyre for like five years, and they couldn't get it done. And then later on, the Babylonians tried to lay siege to Tyre, and uh, they were there for 13 years, and they couldn't get the job done. And then Alexander the Great came along, and he had a different strategy. What he did was he took the ruins from the old city of Tyre, and he built a causeway from the mainland out to the island. And uh, so his armies could just march across there. And so in a matter of five months, Alexander the Great did what uh, the Syrians and the Babylonians couldn't do, which was to, to conquer the, the Tyres. And, and they were a very wealthy city. And uh, as it says here in verse 4, he's going to cast her wealth into the sea. Now, <clears throat> every, all the surrounding uh, cities around there, you know, they, they assumed that Tyre was impregnable too. And uh, so when they saw Alexander the Great uh, defeat Tyre, as it says here in verse 5, it says, Ashkelon will see it and be afraid. Gaza too will writhe, writhe in great pain. And Ekron, for her expectation, has been confounded. Moreover, the king will perish from Gaza and Ashkelon will not be inhabited. So what's interesting about this, it, it mentions these three cities, and they're all terrified after they witness what Alexander the Great has done. And it mentions Ashkelon, Gaza, and Ekron. And in that very order, Alexander the Great conquered those cities. And so very interesting that, you know, really very accurately, historically, what happens. And uh, so you skip down to verse 9, or verse 8, uh, it, it makes reference to Jerusalem then. And Alexander's attempt to, to take that city and says, but I will camp around my house because of an army, because of him who passes by and returns, and no oppressor will pass over them anymore. For now my, I have seen with my eyes. And so that is basically a prophecy that God is going to protect Jerusalem from being conquered by Alexander the Great, you know, in, in, a, uh, uh, in, in a military conquest. Now, what's interesting about this is that as Alexander was on his way, that it, uh, Josephus, uh, the Jewish historian, uh, says that the, uh, the Lord apparently gave the high priest a dream, and in that dream, uh, you know, he told him that you know that he was coming. And that when he was on his way there, that what he was to do, all the people in the city were to dress in white robes and they were go, to go out and meet Alexander the Great in a peaceful way. So that's what they did. When they heard he was coming, they all dressed up in white robes. The priests dressed up in their high priestly robes. And uh, they walked out to meet him. And, uh, and as they were approaching his army and Alexander was in front of his army, he dismounted his horse and he walked up to the high priest and he knelt down and worshiped. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, his commander saw all this and he thought, what? what in the world are you doing? And uh, he told his commander, well, I had a dream. And, I, and, and in my dream, what I saw was that as I approached Jerusalem, that all these people would come out to me in white robes and the message was given to me that when I see this, that I'm to treat these people with grace. And so, you know, that, that's just a miraculous deliverance of the Lord, uh, how that happened. And, uh, and so, you know, that what, what they did, uh, uh, the, Alexander the Great met together with the priest, and uh, they had, kind of came to a negotiated settlement that they would continue to be able to to worship their God and, and make some concessions on paying taxes and things like that. But Israel was not conquered in the same way as these 
other cities. So really, uh, God is watching out for his people. And that's really kind of the point of this book, is, is to give encouragement uh, to the Jewish people as they, as they have just returned from their captivity in, uh, in, in Babylon. And uh, interesting, as we move on, verse 9 here uh, is, is a verse I think we're going to it sound familiar to us. It says, uh, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, and he is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, where have we heard that before? Huh. That sounds like the triumphant uh, entry into Jerusalem of, of Jesus. And, uh, of course, that was uh, foretold back here in Zechariah. And so, uh, you know, that's uh, another prophetic uh, uh, passage there. And uh, then the, the next verse, it says, And I will uh, cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off, and he will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea. So verse 9 is talking about the first advent of the king, you know, when he comes into Jerusalem just before his crucifixion. Verse 10 is a reference to his second advent uh, when he comes to rule over all the nations of the earth, and it will be a worldwide uh, reign of Christ. And uh, uh, verse, uh, uh, verses uh, 14 and 15, as we skip ahead, uh, saying the Lord will appear over them and his yeah the, the Lord will appear over them and uh, the arrow will go forth like lightning the Lord will blow the trumpet and will march in, in the storm winds of the earth and, and the Lord of hosts will descend will uh, defend them and they will devour and trample on uh, sling stones and they will, will drink and be uh, boisterous with wine. They will be filled with the sacrifice of uh, the basin and drenched in, in the corners of the altar. And, uh, and, and you know, this is a reference that the Lord is going to, you know, be crushing the, the enemies of the Jews. And, and uh, you know, what most Bible scholars say is this is a reference to the Maccabean period when uh, they were able to uh, uh, or no, this is uh, uh, enabling Israel to crush your enemies uh, during the tribulation period. Okay, so, uh, uh, but I, I guess I skipped over verses 12 and 13. That's what I was looking for. I skipped the point there. Where uh, verse 12, it says, Return to the stronghold, O prisoners who have hope. This very day I am declaring uh, that I will restore double to you. For I will bend Judah as my bow, and I will fill the bow with Ephraim, and I will stir up your sons, O Zion, and uh, your sons, O Greece, and I will make you like a warrior sword. And that is uh, a reference to uh, Israel throwing off the rule of the Greeks during the Maccabean period, which was just prior uh, to the coming of Christ. It's that kind of that in-between period. Uh, between uh, you know the last book of the Old Testament and when the New Testament era begins, as we come to verses uh, uh, or, or chapter ten, it is uh, really a lot of promises concerning Israel during the Messianic reign. We won't really take that; it's just kind of you know it kind of pertains to to Israel. A lot of symbolic language there. Uh, as we uh, come to uh, chapter eleven. Uh, it's talking about the destruction of, Rome, of Jerusalem by Rome. And uh, one of the things we see in this passage, starting in verse 4, it says, uh, Thus says the Lord, uh, my God, pasture the flock uh, doomed to slaughter. And uh, basically what God is asking Zechariah to do in this passage is to kind of do some, some role play. You know, sometimes... God does that with his prophets to, to illustrate a point, is to have them uh, play a role. And in this case, he's asking Zechariah to play the role of a shepherd of, of, uh, of his people. And it's interesting, he goes, pasture my flock doomed to slaughter. And so, you know, 
God is saying my flock is doomed to slaughter. And uh, what this is a reference to is, uh, is the, the conquest of, of, of Jerusalem in 70 AD uh, by Rome. And so uh, uh, as we go on here, verse 8, uh, well, it says, uh, well, verse 5, it says, those who, who buy them uh, and, and go unpunished, and each of those who sell them says, blessed be the Lord, for I become rich, and their own shepherds have no pity on them, for I shall no longer uh, pity, uh, have pity on the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord, but I will, uh, shall cause them in uh, to each into one another's uh, power and into the power of his king and will strike the land and will not deliver them from their power. Uh, so he says, I pastured the flock, uh, doomed to slaughter, hence afflicted uh, to the flock, and I took for myself two staffs, um, one uh, staff called favor and the other called union, and I pastured the flock. And then verse 8 tells us, then I annihilated three shepherds, uh, one month uh, for my soul and yeah, make sure I didn't skip things. One month for my soul and patient with them, and their soul also was weary me. That I said, uh, I will not pasture you. Uh, what is uh, what is to die? Let it die, and what is to be annihilated? Let it be annihilated, and let those who are left uh, to eat one another's flesh. And uh, basically, what what he's talking about here, you know, when he destroyed three shepherds. This is a reference to really the destruction of three offices, the office of priest or prophet, priest, and king. In other words, what's going to happen is really the nation of Israel is going to be destroyed and the people are going to be dispersed throughout the nation. <laughs> and like I said, this, this happened when Rome conquered Jerusalem in 70 AD. And that really kind of served a purpose for God because... Uh, the thing is, if, if, if God were allowed Jerusalem to keep on functioning in their normal uh, way, in their normal system, it, it really would have allowed a competing system of worship to exist. And, uh, you know, when Jesus came, he gave us a new uh, system of worship, you know, worshiping the Son. And, you know, we are uh, redeemed and our sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, that's kind of awkward uh, when God's temple is still uh, functioning and offering animal sacrifices. You know, well, what, what are you going to do that? Well, you know, we, we worship, you know, the blood of the light of Jesus here. And over here, you know, we're redeemed by the blood of animal sacrifices. Well, you know, and, and this is God's temple. Well, you know, is God going to let both of those go on at the same time? No. So that's why he allowed the Romans to overtake the city of Jerusalem and destroy the temple. And Jesus foretold this, that one stone will not be left upon another. And what I've heard is that what happened is, you know, that, that, so that one stone was not left upon another in a literal sense, is that the, the temple was burned, and with all the gold and silver in the temple, it was melted, and a lot of it seeped into the, the cracks in between the stones, and so the people, you know, wanting to, you know, salvage some of that gold and silver, they took all the stones apart to get all that melted silver and gold. And so really, uh, you know, this all factored into that prophecy that Jesus gave before his death, that one stone would not be left upon another. So the temple is destroyed by the design of God, so there is no longer a competing system of, of worship in Israel. And uh, verse, as we go on to verse 10, it says, And I will take my staff, favor, and cut it into pieces to break my covenant, which I have made with all the peoples. Now, at, at first we see that, it sounds like he's saying I'm breaking my covenant with uh, Israel. And that's not what it's saying, because God has an everlasting covenant with his people. But what it says here, I'm breaking my covenant with the peoples. And what this is a reference to is all the nations. And, and apparently this is a, a reference that God had got a, you know, in, in some way had a covenant that he would protect Israel from all the surrounding nations so that 
they would not destroy her. And what he's saying is, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna invalidate that covenant so you know that no longer do they have my divine protection. You see, Israel rejected their Messiah. And when they did so, they are kind of rejecting the protection of God upon them uh, as a people. And, you know, and we see in all the centuries since then, you know, Israel, the Jews have been a persecuted people, a terrible persecution. And so, you know, God is, re is uh, uh, removing his uh, protection and allowing them to be an annihilated. Then in verses 12 and 13, we have some uh, interesting reference to Judas. And it says, and I said to them, if it is good in your sight, give me my wages, but if not, never mind. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Where have we heard that before? Mm -hmm. uh, and the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, uh, that the price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. And of course, this is really kind of a fulfillment of what happened. Uh, after Jesus, Judas had betrayed Jesus for 30 shekels of, si of silver, he felt very guilty about that afterwards. And so he took the, the money that they had paid it and he threw it in the temple. Well, you know, the, the priests, you know, they figured, well, you know, this is blood money. You know, we can't really, you know, just take this money and use it. So what they did with it is they, uh, they, they bought what's called the potter's field. To, to bury people that didn't have a place to be buried. And so that's kind of, you know, foreshadows, uh, you know, Judas and what happened to him. And then uh, verses 15 to 17 is a, a foreshadow of the Antichrist, where it says, the Lord said to me, take again for yourself the equipment of a foolish shepherd. For behold, I am going to raise up a shepherd in the land who will not take care of, uh, who, who will, not take care for the uh, perish, perishing, seek the scattered, uh, heal the broken, or sustain the one who stand standing, but will devour the flesh of the fat sheep and tear off their hooves. And you know this seems to be a reference to the Antichrist, like in the first half of the tribulation, where he will join into a covenant with the nation of Israel at that time, and they will embrace him. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's not looking out for their best interest. So, I mean, he hopes he's good to him for a while, but eventually he's going to turn on them. And uh, so he's kind of referred to here as a, uh, 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 a wicked shepherd or a, a foolish shepherd. And so, uh, so as we uh, come to chapter 12, then, or as we come to the last two chapters, we see some recurring themes that, kind of appear in random and repeated order. And those themes are the nations will gather against Jerusalem uh, and the situation will be dire for the Jews and the Lord will arrive when defeat is imminent and Israel will be strengthened to defeat her enemy. So you know, that there, things are going to kind of be a little bit mixed up uh, in, in order here, but those are kind of the recurring themes of this section. And verse... Uh, Verses 1 through 9 of chapter 12 talks about the final uh, siege of Jerusalem. And it begins here in verse 4, in verse 1, it says, The burden of the Lord uh, concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundations of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. And what's significant about that is God is uh, basically... In this revelation to Zechariah, he's, he's really kind of laying out his credentials, you know, as, as a way to tell the people, hey, listen up. The one who's telling you this is, you know, pretty high and mighty. He's, he's the one that stretched out the heavens. He's the one that laid the foundations of the earth. And he's the one that has put the spirit in man. And so when he proceeds to tell him that, in verses 2 to 9, if that is, uh, well, it's verse 2 here. It says, Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling or, or staggering mm. to all the peoples around. And when the siege against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. And it will come about in that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples, uh, 
all who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. And in that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with bewilderment and his rider with madness, and I will watch over the house of Judah while I strike every horse with, with, blind, with blindness. And so what this is talking about is God in these last days in the battle, this is a reference to the battle of Armageddon. What God is going to do, he's going to draw the nations of the, of the earth to Jerusalem. And the metaphor he uses here is like a drunkard being drawn to his strong drink. I mean, they're going to be, you know, you know, when, when somebody's an alcoholic and they got to have a drink, there's nothing going to stop them. And, uh, and that's kind of the, the image that he uses here, that drawing the nations to Jerusalem to lay siege against it. But it says here, then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, a strong support for us uh, are the inhabitants of Jerusalem, though the Lord of hosts say, uh, their God. In that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot uh, amongst, among pieces of wood and a flaming torch among the sheaves, so that they will consume on the right hand and on the left hand all the surrounding peoples while the inhabitants of Jerusalem dwell uh, on their own sites in Jerusalem. And the Lord will save the tents of Judah first in order that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem may not be magnified above Judah. And in that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David. In other words, that's saying, you know, the weakest among them will be a mighty warrior like David. And, uh, and the house of David will be like God, like the, like the angel of the Lord before them. And so the, all the nations of the earth are going to be drawn until they siege to Jerusalem, and God is going to empower his people to defeat them and annihilate them. And, uh, you know, I, I can't help but wonder if in this process uh, is, is when the Lord returns. Uh, you know, because this is a picture of the Battle of Armageddon, and, you know, the Lord returns and he empowers his people and they defeat these enemies because look what happens afterwards verse 10 and this really kind of this is kind of what i want to focus on tonight because it's really a powerful passage it says that i will pour out on the house of david you know the inhabitants of jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so they will look upon uh so they will look upon, uh, they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for their an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the weep, bitter weeping of a firstborn. Now, who is that referring to? It's referring to Jesus. In other words, after this great defeat and deliverance by the Lord, and that's why I say, I think it's, you know, that's when the Lord comes back and he delivers them and they fight with him and they're gonna look they're gonna look at him, they're gonna, oh, you're the one that came to save us two thousand years ago. And we ignored you, we, we rejected you. And they're gonna weep over him like a, a parent who has parents who have lost their only child. And uh, that's gonna be how great their grief is. And uh, so it's gonna be, you know. Uh, it goes on here, and in that day uh, there will be great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of uh, mm -hmm. Hadadrim in, in the plain of Megiddo. Now, Megiddo, that's Armageddon. That's the word that's translated Armageddon. And the land will mourn every family by itself. And uh, verse 14, all the families that uh, remain, every family by itself, their, their wives and themselves. And in that day, verse uh, chapter 13, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and impurity. Now, what do you think that fountain is? That fountain is, is the blood of Jesus. And it will be uh, opened up and their, their sins will be washed away. And it will come about in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, and they will no longer be remembered, and I will uh, remove the, 
the prophets and the unclean spirits from the land. And as we look, if you look back in uh, chapter 3, verse 9, uh, there, there's a kind of an interesting reference there. It says, uh, Behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua, and that, that's a reference to Jesus, uh, on, on one stone are seven eyes, and behold, uh, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. And so, in, in this time, there is going to be a sudden conversion of the Jewish people to Jesus Christ. Now, what's interesting about that is that that is exactly what Paul tells us is going to happen in Romans chapter 11. Uh, you know, if you want to turn back there, keep your finger here and turn back to, turn up to uh, Romans 11. And this is a, an interesting section of scripture uh, talking about the, the Jewish people in the scheme of things. And uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 26, it says, uh, you know, Paul is kind of talking about the unfolding of events, and it says, and thus all Israel will be saved. Just as it's written, the deliverers uh, will come from Zion and remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sin. That's exactly what happens. Uh, that, that Zechariah is foretell, foretelling. Now, uh, since uh, Christ has come for the first time, how long has that been? About 2,000 years. What's been going on with the Jews all that time that they haven't received their Messiah? What's, what's the deal here? Well... Let's look back in verse 8 of Romans 11. And, you know, you're in this section of, of Scripture, Romans uh, chapters 9 through 11. He's talking about the Jewish problem. Why aren't the Jews being converted? And uh, uh, in, in, in chapter 9, well, one of the reasons that he says is he, he brings up the subject of election. That's kind of a subject a lot of us don't like to talk about. But the Bible addresses it plainly. He says, not all Israel is Israel. And not all who are descendants of Abraham are children of Abraham. In other words, uh, uh, the promise is according to God's choice. And he gives the illustration of uh, uh, Isaac and, and, and Ishmael. He says you know, that, that uh, Isaac inherited the promise and Ishmael did not, even though they're both sons of Abraham. And then he, you know, he gives the, uh, the example of Jacob and Esau and how they were twins. And before they were even born, before they'd done anything good or bad, it says the older will serve the younger, which means that uh, you know Jacob would inherit the promise and Esau would not. And uh, Paul, speaking for God and defending that, uh, you know, he says... Uh, this is a, you know, according to my purpose. Uh, as it says here in Romans 9, uh, uh, 16, I believe, or, or, uh, or, or 9, 11, it says, uh, for those of twins were not yet born and had not yet done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose, according to his choice, might stand. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. In other words, God had a purpose for calling Jacob instead of Esau. What was that purpose? I don't know. He didn't tell us. You know, maybe it was uh, who was going to be the, the his descendants. Uh, that might be it. But that's just a that's just a guess. But see, God chose Jacob over Esau just because he that was his purpose. And then uh, uh, it, what's interesting is as it goes on here, uh, Paul. Uh, through the inspiration of the Spirit, raises a rhetorical objection. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there, no, is there no injustice? If God is there, may it never be. And then uh, he, he says this, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. You know? yeah, and so, you know, God is defending his actions just by saying, hey, that's what I decided to do. And, uh, 
And, and then uh, later on, you know, it, uh, he, Paul raises another rhetorical uh, objection, uh, verse 19. He says, "Then, uh, well, well, before that, um, verse eight, verse 16 it says, so then it does not depend on the man who wills or on the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. And then the rhetorical objection, verse 19, is, you will say then to me, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? In other words, you know, God's got this all figured out. You know, uh, who, who's going to inherit the promise? And what can we do? And God's answer to that, on the contrary, he says, oh, man, uh, who are you, oh, man, who answers back to God? Mm. In other words, uh, <laughs> who do you think you are questioning me about my choices? And so, you know, that, that's, it, it's kind of a difficult chapter to wade through. But here's, here's the thing. Verse 9 talks about <clears throat> that part of the reason that Israel, that, that most of the Jews have been set aside for this 2,000 year period is because of God's choice. Now we get we come to verse, chapter 10, and it's because of their unbelief. And so there's human responsibility that's a factor in it too. Now how do we put those two together? Uh, well, the best way I can explain it is, just to kind of use a physical example, is that what is required for us to live? We have to eat, don't we? And that is our responsibility. We have to eat. And if we don't eat, we're going to die. But you know what you got to have in order to eat? you got to have an appetite. You know, if, if you don't have any desire for food, you're not going to eat food. You know, there's some... Uh, situations like when people are undergoing chemotherapy or something like that, and they completely lose their appetite, and food actually becomes repulsive to them. You know, it makes them sick. And so they have to be force-fed with a tube or intravenous. So, so you, have to, you have to, by your own will, eat, but in order to eat, you got to have an appetite. Now, a person that is not in normal physical condition, if they don't have an appetite, they can't will themselves to have an appetite. Okay, that's beyond their power. And to apply that spiritually, in order to come to God, you know, we have to believe his word. We have to believe the gospel. That's our part. But in order to believe the gospel, we have to have an appetite and a hunger for the things of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I've run into a lot of people over the years that you talk to them about the things of the Lord, about the Word of God and the Gospel, and they are not the least bit interested in it. They, 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 they call you crazy. They want to change the subject. They have absolutely no interest. You know, they don't have an appetite for the things of God. And you know what? You, you can't make them have an appetite for the things of God. The only thing that will make them have an appetite for the truth of God is the Spirit of God. So that's the same. See, the Bible teaches us that in our natural human condition, that an appetite for God is not really a naturally occurring thing. It's something that God gives us. And then when God gives us that appetite for his truth and for his son, and we take in the word of God, then we come to faith. You see, it takes both the word of God and the power of the spirit of God together to bring us to faith and new life in Jesus Christ. And so that's kind of the mystery of the gospel is that it takes our response and it takes God working in our hearts as well because we don't have the power to change our hearts. That's beyond our power. And so and so that, and so that brings us to this uh, interesting verse in Romans 11 <clears throat> talking about why the Jews have resisted Jesus Christ all these years. Verse 8 says, just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor. Eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. So why has Israel not yet come to, to faith? Because God's given them a spirit of stupor. Now we, we, we think, you know, I, I am going to fully acknowledge here that all this stuff that I've been talking about, it's offensive to me. It is naturally offensive to our human sensibilities. 
But that's just what God does. I mean, when God says he's given his people a spirit of stupor down to this very day, he's given them a spirit of stupor down to this very day. And we can see the evidence of that. I mean, there are some Jews, isolated cases, where they come to faith. But you go over to Israel and you try to preach the gospel, they're just going to look at you strange. Uh, they're they're going to, they're gonna, you know, get out of here. You know, this is, our, this is our country. Don't tell us about your Jesus. They're not interested. Why aren't they interested? Because God has not opened their heart by his spirit. Now, what's going to change in those last days that Zechariah uh, talks about? Well, it tells us right here in verse 10. Then I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of, J of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. That's why it all changes. Grace changes everything. And when God pours his spirit out upon the Jews, what's going to happen that day? They're all going to believe in a single day. They're just like Paul says, and all of Israel will be saved. And that's a miracle. That's a miracle of God's grace. Now, there's, there, there's a lesson for us here that we really ought to pay attention to. And that is when we are sharing the gospel with somebody and they are totally resistant to it, uh, we need to understand that is a spiritual issue. There is a spirit of darkness that hardens their heart. And the only thing that can overcome that spirit of darkness is not your smart arguments, but the spirit of God. Now, how do we activate the spirit of God? Prayer. You see, what did uh, Peter say when, um, in, 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 or I think it was Peter, yeah, in Acts chapter 6, when they, when they, were, uh, need, when they needed to wait the, the widow's tables, and uh, you know, the, the apostles didn't think they could be bothered with that, so they said, hey, you choose for yourselves you know, a bunch of deacons to take care of this because we have to attend to the ministry of the word and the prayer. Those are the big two things in gospel ministry. The ministry of the word and prayer. You know, the ministry of the word is, is the power that goes forth, you know, and, and, and convicts the heart and the mind. And, the, and prayer is, is, the, is what we do to activate the power of God to do what we can't do. We can't open people's hearts. And I think all of us have loved ones that we wish we could, but we can't. And so that's when we get down on our knees and say, God, you know, I've shared with them truth for years. I can't move them. You know, you're going to have to open their heart because that, that's all that's left to do. And so that is why Israel is going to be saved in these last days. There's going to be a sudden awakening. And, and then uh, going on in these, in these verses in, in chapter 13 in Zechariah, it talks about uh, uh, you know, that there, that there's no longer going to be a need for, for prophets. In fact, if somebody gets up and prophesies during those days, you know, their, their parents are going to say, hey, you know, you pierce that guy through. Because why? Because Jesus is going to be present and there will no longer be the need for the spirit of prophecy because the prophet will be among us. And that's just what Paul tells us in, in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, where there are prophecies, someday they will cease. And this will be that day when they cease. Now, you know, we, we still proclaim the word of God in prophetic utterances today, but there will come a day when, when, when we don't. And so the, the, the sudden spiritual awakening of, of Israel. Uh, when we come to uh, uh, verse uh, 7, it says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the, the man my associate, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered, and I will turn him my hand against the, the little ones, and it will come about in the land, declares the Lord. Two parts of it will be cut off and perish, and a third will be left in it. And so during that day, during that, that final battle of Armageddon, it says two-thirds of the people are going to perish. Now, as we get to verse 14, there's some interesting things here. And it's talking about, uh, again here, it's kind of getting back to, to referring to the, the return of Christ to this earth. It says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord 
when the spoil will be taken from among you and divided among you, and I will gather all the nations against Israel to battle, and the city will be captured, and the houses plundered, and the women ravished, and half of the city exiled, and the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. Now listen to this. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle so that the half of the mountain will be moved toward the north and the other half toward the south. And this is when Christ, this is another picture when Christ returns. He lands on the Mount of Olives, and when he lands on it, he lands on it with such power <coughs> that it splits the mountain in half. And uh, what's interesting about that is uh, where is it that Jesus launched off from when he left this earth? The Mount of Olives. And the angels appeared, you know, as he as he lifted up from that from the Mount of Olives and the, the people would all Google-eyed watch him go up, and an angel appeared, and he says, you know, behold, as he, as he, have you seen him depart, he will come again. So that's a prophecy you know, that, that angel gave in Acts that he's going to return on the Mount of Olives, and that's just what it, what it talks about here. And uh, uh, let's see, and uh, the, the, the rest of the chapter really talks about uh, some of the features of the Millennium Kingdom. Uh, in that day when Christ returns and he, he rules over the, the earth. Uh, some of the more interesting highlights, verse 9 says, and the Lord will be king over all the earth in that day. And the Lord will be the only one, and his name will be the only one. You know what's interesting about that? Is that there is a movement on even today for a globalist uh, government where there's a one world ruler, and that's what the the, uh, uh, you know, the Bible prophesies, you know, that the Antichrist, you know, will rise up and be a one world ruler. And, you know, uh, they're, they're very practical. Way. That sounds like a very good idea. That way you don't have nations warring against each other. Except when that one world ruler is a sinner, it's not going to turn out very well. And that's why God has nations, is so that when there arises a tyrannical government, there's somebody else someplace else to go to or somebody to, to you know, to, to put that guy in check. But you know what? When Christ returns and he sets up his rule over all the earth, that will be heaven on earth because he will be the perfect king. And, there, you know, there's no better kind of rule to have than a benevolent dictatorship of the Lord. I mean, that's, that, it doesn't get any better than that uh, because he's perfect in all his ways. And it says uh, the land will change into a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. Uh, but Jerusalem will rise up. So the whole, the whole area is going to be flattened out, but uh, Mount Zion will rise above uh, the rest of it you know, and be kind of the focal point of that area. And uh, verse 12 is an interesting verse. It says, now, this will be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the, pro all the people's who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while, while they stand on their feet and their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongue will rot in their mouth. Uh, it will come about in that day that a great panic from the Lord will fall on them and they will seize one another's hands and the hand of one another lift up against uh, one another. You know, well, you know what that picture reminds me of? About, I don't know, wasn't it 40 years ago? Raiders of the Lost Ark. And of course, you know, all, here's all these evil Nazis trying to find uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And the last scene in the movie is all these evil Nazis. They, they've got the Ark of the Covenant there in this cave. And somebody opens it up. And these spirit-like beings come out. And they fly around the room. And they land on these evil Nazis. And their faces just melt away. And uh, you know, that, that's kind of what that reminds That's kind of a picture of what that reminds me of it. You know, that uh, he says their, their eyes will, will, uh, will melt in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouth. And so, you know, God is going to strike his enemies down. And, uh, and uh, some of the interesting concluding remarks, verse 16, then it will come about that those who are left of all the nations that went up against Jerusalem 
will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of the host, and celebrate the Feast of Booths. Now, you know what's something that's very interesting that we don't consider? Is that during the tribulation, there are going to be people from the nations who were not raptured and are going to survive the tribulation. And they're going to be here during the millennium kingdom. You know, maybe, perhaps they'll be unsaved. That'll be an interesting situation. But you know what? It says the Lord is going to rule with a rod of iron. And so there won't be any nonsense that's tolerated. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and so yeah, but, 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 but it says here that it's going to be required of these people from year to year to go celebrate the Feast of Booths. Now, why the Feast of Booths? What is the Feast of Booths? Well, that's when they would have a festival every year and be kind of a camp out festival where they'd make these little <clears throat> stick huts and they would remember the wilderness wonders and how God provided for his people. And it, it, it kind of morphed into really a celebration of God's provision. And so this is probably going to be a, a kind of a situation where people are, are celebrating how God is providing for them. Because, you know, what the scripture talks about in the Millennium Kingdom is that it's going to be a time of unprecedented productivity of the land. And there's going to be an abundance. And so uh, every year, you know, the people are, from all the earth are going to be required to gather to celebrate uh, the Feast of Booths. And uh, it says, and it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king and the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. So if you don't go to celebrate the Feast of Booths, you get drought for the next year. And, and that, so that's going to kind of motivate you to, you know, to kind of, you know, keep that feast. Uh, another interesting thing, uh, it says, uh, and in that day, verse 20, uh, there will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord, you know, and the cooking pots in the, in the Lord's house will be like the bowls before the altar. In other words, you know, everything is going to be kind of special. And every cooking pot <coughs> in Jerusalem will be holy to the Lord. And all the sacrifice, and all who sacrifice will come and take of them and boil in them. Uh, what's interesting is that in those in that millennium period too, the, there's going to be the reinstituting of sacrifices, animal sacrifices, and that'll be interesting because I mean Jesus will be ruling over all. But I think what those sac the function of those sacrifices is going to be to remind us really of the gruesomeness of what it costs to be redeemed. Because, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be able to see him. We'll, we'll, we'll be aware of, of, of what he's done. But, you know, we may not really comprehend the, the graphic nature of, of, of what it really took for him to sacrifice his life for us. So I think that's probably what, what these sacrifices, you know, it'll be kind of like our communion service. You know, we, we take communion. That doesn't uh, have any kind of... Uh, function of imparting grace to us, but it's a reminder so that, you know, I mean, that, that's the function of, of the Lord's Supper, is that it continually reminds us that uh, uh, what the reason that we are, are the Lord's people is because of what he did on the cross for us. And I like to say that, that, that the main function of, of, uh, of communion is, is, is to remind us to keep the main thing the main thing. Yes. Because you know what, as a, as a church, as a people who want to engage in good works, it would be easy just to kind of, you know, become focused on becoming a charitable organization and, you know, having a soup kitchen and doing this and doing that and really kind of forgetting about, you know, what Jesus did. And this reminds us every time we do it, hey, this is what it's all about. You know, we're, we're the Lord's people. We're redeemed by his blood. We're made new by his life that, that's come to dwell in us. And so that wraps it up for the, uh, the book of Zechariah. And I think Brian uh, is going to start off in uh, verse, uh, or in Malachi next week and wrap up the Old Testament. So that kind of does it for tonight and for the book of Zechariah. And uh, I'm out of breath. That's a, little, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of section to cover there. So anyway, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you again for this time that we can study your word and for the, the great truth that you teach us, Lord. 
We thank you, Lord, for your sovereign grace and for your mercy upon us, Lord. Uh, and we thank you, Lord, that there is going to come a day when all of Israel is going to be saved, Lord. And so, Lord, help us to always be dependent upon your spirit and your word uh, as we try to bring others to, to, to faith in Jesus Christ uh, during this age of the Gentiles, Lord. Because, Lord, you've, uh, you've set your targets on us. And so, Lord, help us to be diligent in that work of bringing people into your kingdom. And again, Lord, we, we thank you for this book that encourages us, gives us a, a glimpse of uh, what you have accomplished and what you will accomplish in the future, Lord. And, just, and it just strengthens our faith in, in uh, what we have to look forward to. And we thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.